All right, so in, uh, in this video, I wanna go over some background into the current experiment that we're doing on 4140 steel. Um, as you know, uh, you may either be doing the quenching and tempering uh, experiment, or you may be doing an isothermal transformation. Uh, so this video will cover both. Um, so feel free to, to skip through if, you, um, uh, if you're in one uh, portion of the class and, and, and you're I'm talking about the other, but I do recommend listening to the whole the whole thing. Okay, so let's just go over some basics first. Uh, let's go over what 4140 steel is. Um, so as you may be aware, uh, the designations that we have for for steel, um, the first digit, the you know the thousands, the four thousand series tells you about what type of steel it is. And so this is from Wikipedia, and you can see that the 4000 series is what's known as a molybdenum steel. Um, and then uh, the um, the 100 signifies also, you know, what's in it. And then the, the 40 here, as with all of these designations, the last two digits refers to the amount of carbon. And so you can see that for um, point or so for four zero four two four five you can see that the amount is roughly the same as point the percent so here we have roughly 0.4 weight percent carbon and so it's a, a medium carbon steel uh, we also can refer to it as uh, chrome molly uh, because there is some chromium in it as well so you can see the main alloying elements for this 41 series uh, there's some uh, chromium you can see it's about a percent uh, there is some molybdenum, like I said, this is the kind of the new addition in the series. There's uh, carbon, uh, there can be some manganese, uh, again, around 1%, and then phosphorus and sulfur are impurities, and then we also have a little bit of silicon. So that's kind of what this is for. Um, it's a fairly um, high strength um, alloy. Uh, this particular one in this series uh, is often used in uh, bicycle frames, uh, so very high strength for weight ratio. Uh, and so that's just one of the examples uh, that we have for, for this one. All right, so like we can with really most steels, we can also look at the iron, iron carbide phase diagram to get an idea of where we're at. Right, and so we all uh, for steel we denote really anything under two weight percent uh, because above that we start going through the eutectic transformation here, uh, which would give us uh, something more like cast iron. But anything under two, and so we are at uh, 0.4 weight percent as I said, uh, and so we're at this level, and so you can see that in this type of steel, um, it is going to be what we call pro eutectoid right so 0.76 is the eutectoid point where we form um, uh, the mixture of ferrite and cementite known as perlite uh, but below it the pro eutectoid we form some pro eutectoid uh, ferrite so the alpha phase here so you would expect a mixture of at equilibrium um, you would expect a mixture of perlite and pro eutectoid right from from our diagram here um, so all of our reactions have to do with transformations and a lot of them are not uh, what we'd consider equilibrium and so we also want to look at uh, di transformation diagrams and so I'm putting up the uh, isothermal transformation diagram or time temperature um, transformation diagram so TTT this is of 4340 um, so not 4140. Uh, I have posted the uh, diagram for 4140, so you can take a look and see what the similarities are. But we're going to use this to study the different transformations that we're going to do in this lab. So if you're wondering um, why we choose a certain temperature in our uh, handout, uh, take a look at that combination and kind of overlay it on the TTT. So let's take a look at the first one, which both groups have, and that is this diffusionless Martensitic transformation. And so with this, we assume that we start at a very high temperature, and it's above the eutectoid temperature. And once you do that, whatever is in the steel uh, becomes austenitic, 
or has the austenite phase, which is the FCC form of um, iron. And when we have diffusion lists, that means that we're not allowing a lot of time for diffusion-based processes to happen. And so this is an example of a non-equilibrium transformation, but it's the diffusionless, very rapid quenching of our steel from, you know, in the lab we do 850, here it's showing 800, to room temperature in a very short order of time. And so if you can look at the time diagram, time axis down here, you see 10 seconds, right? So as long as we're able to cool it down in that kind of um, uh, general time frame, then we're able to get Martin Civic or Martin site. And that occurs at specific temperatures and uh, finishes at other specific temperatures. That's why we think of it as diffusionless. And that has a general appearance, um, something like this, where um, there's lots of small particles and they're uh, lens or needle shaped on two dimensional cross section. So you kind of see all these kind of uh, needle shapes at different angles. And that is martensite. So we get this, we have this transformation in both of the, the lab groups. So we want to talk, make sure we talk about martensite and its formation. So now for the quenching and tempering group, everything that we do is going to be based off of quenching our samples down to room temperature and having this type of martensitic uh, microstructure. That's the starting point. And so then we look at the stages of tempering. And so I'm going to show you this um, table uh, from uh, the metals book that, that I used and I, I reference um, in the uh, canvas and, and our module. Uh, you can find more about those, those chapters. Uh, but these are the various stages of tempering. Um, and we're obviously tempering 4140 steel. So this is, again, after we austenitize and quench to form martensite, and then this is bringing the temperature back up to one of these temperatures. So we start out in the room temperature to 100, so low temperature. Um, what happens is that carbon that's been trapped in that martensitic structure, so if you're unfamiliar with uh, the formation of martensite, you might go back um, to the chapter to kind of learn a little bit more about it. But basically, um, uh, austenite has a, 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 all of the carbon uh, dissolved into the FCC lattice, and then ferrite, which is the low temperature BCC structure, cannot hold as much carbon. So when we have this um, metastable transformation to martensite, all of that carbon gets trapped and we form a BCT or body center tetragonal structure. And so when we reheat, the equilibrium phase is ferrite, and so the carbon wants to diffuse. So most of these are diffusion-based processes that occur. But in the first low temperature, we see that carbon can segregate to dislocations and boundaries, and you can get pre-precipitation clustering and ordering. And so these are very small effects. So going to dislocations or basically pre-precipitation, that's very small effects. So a lot of times you can't even see this. Um, if we go a little higher, between 100 and 200, you can start to get uh, transition carbides. Um, so there's lots of different carbides uh, that you may see over here. And so you get those, and again, you see that we're talking two nanometers. And this is known as the first stage of tempering. Um, but again, two nanometers, if we're looking at optical, we may not, we're not going to see that. So, um, so a lot of these effects, right? To this point, we haven't seen anything that we could see in an optical micrograph. At the slightly higher temperature, so two to 350 Celsius, um, if we have any what's known as retained austenite, that can transform to ferrite and cementite which is again, uh, like perlite. Um, so that's kind of a, an added fact if we um, maintained any austenite. And this is retained austenite is always a possibility. Um, in the same chapter here in the metals textbook, um, you'll see that uh, the amount of retained austenite is related to the carbon percent. So I recommend that you look at that as well. The other phenomena that happens here is that we can also have um, tempered martensite embrittlement. 
Um, this is caused by um, the uh, some secondary particles from the alloying that can occur. And so this basically makes it more brittle at this very specific temperature range. And again, at the same kind of temperature range, 250 to 350, we can get different shaped um, carbon particles. And this is Fe3C, so cementite. And in this case, they're lathe-shaped uh, precipitates, so they have a specific shape. Uh, again, they tend to still be pretty small. Um, and then here, uh, slightly higher temperature, we can get uh, segregation of impurities and alloying elements. And again, that can be uh, temper and brittlement. So it causes the, the ductility to go down from the segregation. A little higher, um, we can have recovery of dislocations. Uh, and we can also form uh, lathe-like uh, agglomerates. And then we can also uh, form uh, spherical um, Fe3C. So the shape depends. So the whole running theme of all of this is that the increased temperature and increased time allow carbon to diffuse out of this metastable non-equilibrium structure and try to form the equilibrium, which we know to be ferrite plus cementite. So still higher in the 500 to 700 range, we can form um, allo more alloy carbides and then we can get um, um, secondary hardening. And again, this is only going to occur when we have titanium, chromium, molybdenum, vanadium. So these are definitely things that we have. And then still higher in the highest range, we can get recrystallization and grain growth. So things get bigger. And we can also have coarsening of the spherical, spherical or spherical shaped Fe3C. So that means that those Fe3C gets bigger. Um, so let's kind of, uh, I'll show you a couple examples of this. Uh, so we start with the uh, martensite structure. This is the, we have very small, again, lens or lathe-like uh, shapes, needles I, I sometimes refer to them as, uh, martensite. Um, and then as we progress, we're forming very small carbides to start. Again, not typically visible here. So the microstructure doesn't change for a large portion. But then once the carbides get big enough, we should be able to start see them, seeing them. And that's when we get into this um, structure known as tempered martensite. So if it's been tempered from martensite, then we call it tempered martensite. So this actually, this microstructure covers a large percent of what we see. And this is kind of what uh, an example of what we might see. So it's not as uh, zoomed in as the previous image, but again, you still kind of see this uh, needle-like shapes. They're smaller here. Um, and for the most part, it's hard to see those carbides until they get to a certain size. And so the higher temperatures, the carbide particles tend to get higher and higher. And then at a certain point, um, they will spheridize, so they'll get spherical particles, and then they'll continue to grow the longer that we do it. And so this is no, this is what we would call spheridite. So we see the um, we don't see much of the original kind of martensite structure. Uh, really, what we see here is uh, kind of a matrix, just a uniform background being ferrite, and then the spherical particles are cementite, the Fe3C, and again they're roughly spherical. And so we call it, that's why we call it spheridite. And the longer and the higher the temperature, the bigger these uh, cementite particles become. And so that's kind of the transformation. So a lot of them end up looking kind of similar to martensite with not much difference between them uh, until you start to see the carbide particles like these. And at that point, they'll start to uh, become spherical particles and they'll start to get bigger and bigger. So that is, in a nutshell, nutshell the quenching and tempering experiment. There's obviously a lot going on in the uh, specific temperatures, uh, but that's uh, what you'll want to kind of pay attention to in the times and temperatures that you're looking at is what do we see? Martensite, tempered martensite, spheridite, and then uh, what are the differences to the microstructure, but also strength, ductility, so forth. So now I want to switch gears and talk about isothermal transformations. And this is where we get to take full advantage of the isothermal transformation diagram. That's what it's named for. And again, we start with anything that's been austenitized or above the eutectoid temperature. We always do it at 850 in the lab. And then we look at uh, quickly bringing it to another temperature and holding it for a set amount of time at that 
one temperature, so ISO, same temperature. So let's look at the, the first types of transformation. And that's where we go just below the eutectoid. So in the neighborhood of six, or sorry, 700 or, or a little less. So this one looks like about 660 or 670. So if we quickly bring it down to the 670 and then hold it, at the end here, it says we have F plus P. That means ferrite plus perlite. So we have this, you can see here in this region, it says A plus F. So ferrite forms. Remember we have a, this is a pro, this is a pro eutectoid. That means we form a ferrite first, pro eutect, before the eutectoid. Um, and then you form perlite, which is the eutectoid mixture. So we have a mixture of both of those. And so we call it coarse perlite because we're at the highest temperatures and the diffusion links are the, the longest. And so the, the thickness of the perlite colonies is the, the largest. And so we see something that looks like this um, on relatively high magnification. So this is the perlite. Fine perlite is in the same region here, the same general region, but it's at a lower temperature. So this is just under 600. And so if we hold there, we, again, we'd expect to see ferrite, but also perlite as well. And because it's at the lower range, we call it fine because the the depth uh, the distances between these um, ferrite cementite uh, boundaries is smaller because the diffusion depths uh, diffusion links are smaller at the lower temperature. All right, so you'll notice that there's kind of this, what we call double nose, or there's this kind of intermediate position around 550. And that's the cutoff between perlite up here. You can see P for perlite. And then down here, anything in this region now forms what we see here is B or bainite. And so those transformations, so let's say we're uh, just under 400. If we transform, we're in the upper region of temperature. And so we call it upper bainite. And bainite actually has a, a pretty similar appearance to martensite. Um, as you can kind of see here, it's of kind of uh, needle or lens-like shapes. Um, however, there is actually differences in ferrite and cementite or carbides in here. It's just that we can't see that at these kind of low magnifications. We would need something like TEM or, or SEM to see that. Um, and the one thing I'll mention, so this is actually a zoomed in picture from um, electron microscopy, is we see that in um, inside this bainite uh, shape, we see both cementite and ferrite. So you, you have to have pretty high magnification to really be able to tell the difference. All right, so that's upper. And we also have lower bainite, which is at the lower temperature range. So here we're just over 300, uh, but above this martensite. And that's lower because it's in the lower bainite region. Um, however, I'm using the same picture. Um, it's very hard to tell the difference between upper and lower bainite. Um, you know, better metal metallurgists could probably do it than I, but um, for the most part, they look very similar uh, in terms of optical microscopy. And then, like I said, uh, we kind of put in the diffusionless martensitic transformation again, because if we uh, cool below that martensite start, we'll start to get martensite and we'll avoid perlite or bainite formation. And again, we'll see something like this microstructure. And so that rate, um, that kind of rate to form martensite is uh, determined by the, kind of this nose position. How quickly do we have to get below this around 450 before uh, bainite starts to form. So again, that's close to 10 seconds, as you can see here. So we have to cool from above to here in under 10 seconds in order to avoid uh, bainite. So that's kind of this critical value that we'd see here. All right, so that's a, you know, a brief introduction into quenching and tempering and isothermal transformations for our 4140 steel. Um, again, in Canvas um, and uh, so forth. I've put uh, numerous um, uh, articles and, and chapters for you to, to kind of look at more in depth the various topics related to uh, those two experiments.